the motivation behind it being founded to, to really get at it. And uh, we, if we were to look at, say, uh, the Bolshevik re revolution in Russia, and this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to contrast the movement oh. here with other movements. And you know that they, that movement was rooted very deeply in ideological kinds of considerations. Uh, I'm searching for ideology in this movement, but it's so elusive until uh, I'm going to have to conclude, I believe, that there was no basic ideology involved in, in, in the founding of SCLC, N not really the NAACP, unless you don't call uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States an ideology, you know, because uh, they don't, don't really uh, put out pamphlets of right uh, conceptual frameworks uh, which is styles and ideology dealing with the system per se. They come up with uh, tactics and, and, and programs to deal to with problems right. dealing with race relations, yeah. you know. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, really examine that. It's not so I clear in my mind, as you can see, but these are the kinds of things that I'm, I'm trying to look at here. No, they were, I don't think there was an ideology that certainly was comparable to uh, uh, the Marxist-Leninist concept of a changed society. Uh, the nearest to an ideology would be, let's call it the Christian philosophy, and that tied in with the uh, uh, philosophy of Gandhian nonviolence, mass action, uh, nonviolent mass action. See. That was the nearest to it. Uh, but you see, this in itself becomes an elusive sort of a thing. Uh, when the, uh, let's call it, the impact of the, uh, the need to glow uh, enters in. And maybe the influence uh, upon individuals, uh, the individual leadership as to what shall we do next. And the, what shall we do next frequently uh, comes from suggestions to, from sources other than the organization. Uh, like the identification with or speaking out against uh, the identification with the anti-war movement. This did not develop out of the organization. It's out of discussion within the organization. Uh, it no doubt came uh, as a suggestion to the, end of, to the president uh, and uh, uh, the invitation to the president to come and speak at the anti-war rally. And uh, I know something about uh, uh, somebody saying there's a time now for Martin to speak on uh, anti-war. Uh, do you think that this is the time for it? And uh, somebody would say, uh, uh, yes, it is. And somebody would talk to him, somebody that he felt uh, duty-bound, let's call it, to listen to. Okay. So the character then, and I'm trying to, to just uh, theorize here, give almost essay kinds of responses yeah. and I want your reaction to them. The character here then, as I said, would be uh, more and more on an action-oriented kind of a movement uh, than one which would lend itself to a somewhat long-term plan on ideology uh, based on bringing about permanent social change or change in the system as such. And this action-oriented movement lent itself more to spontaneity than it did to the development of a structure uh, which would require a kind of rigid uh, format down through the years. Uh, so this, I think, more than anything else, would reflect uh, of the ultimate character uh, that was inherent in what SCIC was doing. Or would you differ with that? No, I wouldn't differ with it. I think you're quite correct there, because the personnel who uh, uh, provided the leadership for this or for SCLC had never come to grips uh, with a philosophical uh, con uh, concept other than the general concept of non-violent mass action. Now, the uh, uh, I don't think there was much, uh, I'll be gracious and say either time or other bases for uh, in-depth thinking about how far nonviolent mass action can go and to what extent can you really involve people. You see, you may talk about them, 
But when you respond to, uh, as the organization did, to situations, uh, each situation and their, their major, major efforts were in response to situations. And when you exhaust yourself, let's call it on situations like in uh, Florida, or uh, situations in Albany. Like St. Albany. Uh, St. Albany and Albany, yes. Uh, what do you have? Uh, you see, because you haven't, uh, you, and the, all of this is being done within the context, uh, within the time period of two or three years. You see, uh, uh, the, uh, let's call it the uh, uh, overthrow of the Tsar. It was not a two-year thing, right. and uh, people, and maybe the maybe the uh, the general format, not only the format, but the uh, the uh, pattern of of communication and training and action, the development of an anti-Tsarist movement uh, was much more stimulated, I suppose, by the existence of rather harsh physical conditions. And here you have uh, black people living in, quote, end quote, uh, conditions that they were in great affluence. I mean, here's the president becoming an international figure. And these harsh conditions were not... Uh, never really touched never the body. Really, never Probably. really, yes. Now let me... We were trying to uh, uh, spell out uh, the character of, of, of SCLC, and we we uh, concluded that it was an action-oriented kind of a group uh, based on a great deal of spontaneity, and it sought those uh, activities uh, uh, which would allow it the the kind of flexibi flexibility that was necessary for it to 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 be the star of the moment, and this is my addition to it, the star of the moment. And uh, uh, as a result, uh, it uh, aborted its uh, role as being a, a, a long-term kind of a planning organization uh, dead set on fundamental change. And, and I'll repeat again, these uh, conclusions of Gene Walker, and I'm working up to the next point that we're going to raise, Ms. Baker, uh, namely, the role that you played in the settling of uh, or conflict uh, within uh, uh, SNCC. So we want to come to that, if, if we may, because I found that very interesting. But at the same time, I didn't get as much uh, information out of it as I would like to have. And I've read a lot of different accounts, but I want to get it first hand now. Uh, and this is information relative to the compromise uh, between the proponents of nonviolence and the voters' registration. Uh, 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 at, at, at the SNCC meeting in the Holland School. Now, uh, you suggested, and this has been documented, uh, that you urged a compromise on the basis of the need for unity. What I would like to question you on specifically is how, in fact, did you get these two factions to compromise? You know, who were some of these specific individuals involved? Uh, what approach did you use in talking to them? There's no question about your being responsible for the compromise. What I'm trying to question you on is how specifically did you bring it about? I'll try. Okay, okay, okay. So that's what I'd like to know. Uh, I would like to know, and I guess I'd have to ask a more. Are you recording it? Oh, yes, yes, the record is on. The record is on, yes. Now, let me play back. <laughs> Ms. Baker, we'd, we'd like to uh, move away from SCLC per se right now and look at the role uh, that you played in bringing about a compromise between uh, certain factions of SNCC, namely the non-violence group and the voters registration group. Now, I would like to ask you some specific questions about how you were able to bring this compromise about. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask you is, uh, can you recall some of the specific individuals uh, you talked to in either one of the factions and uh, the nature of your conversation with them? Yes, I can. Uh, 
I'm trying to get specific information as to how this compromise uh, uh, came about. Well, I think the to cite who was for uh, nonviolence and uh, the who were for voter registration or the proponents of these two points uh, might have some bearing. One, uh, the people who had come out of, Na of uh, Nashville uh, were more strongly oriented in the uh, philosophy of nonviolence than any other because of uh, Lawson, uh, Reverend Lawson. You see, he had gone to India as a young missionary, I believe. Uh, maybe during the days of, uh, you don't have to make it that stuff so uncomfortable, during the days of uh, Gandhi. And uh, he believed in it. And uh, so you had Diane Nash, uh, Marion Barry, now running for uh, mayor, I believe, of Washington. One of the can I think he's one of the candidates for the mayor, I believe. Uh, and uh, John Lewis and uh, maybe a couple of other people from uh, Nashville. Okay. On the other hand, you had uh, persons who had had some conferences with uh, uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, which would include uh, Charlie Jones of Charlotte and uh, Chuck McHugh. Excuse me, is Charlie Jones a white or black? No, he was black. He was black. He's, uh, have you ever heard of the Charlie Jones and, and, and Chapel, Chapel Hill? I know him, a minister, huh? Right. Yes, I know him. No, no, no relation, of, uh, at least not on the surface. Okay. And uh, Char uh, Charlie and uh, Chuck McDo, uh, and uh, I believe Timothy Jenkins was at that meeting. I'm not too sure. Uh, they were the people who had had this conference, and I think they were uh, sort of um, influence to some extent. So what were the issues? The issue was uh, whether to be maintain, you had to have it just as a non-violent movement. Uh, the uh, voter registration group wanted a voter registration program. So the basic difference was whether you could have a mass non-violent uh, movement in voter registration uh, whether or not you would have the confrontation that the nonviolent advocates were uh, accustomed to and were looking for. So I certainly felt that, number one, historically we had had much too much of dividing forces on the basis of uh, uh, maybe concepts that did not necessarily serve purposes in the long run. And I also perhaps felt and maybe realized uh, beyond the uh, realization of the young that you could not possibly conduct a voter registration program in certain areas without confrontation. Uh, and I, that, I think, was the persuasive uh, argument that if you, uh, for instance, uh, you see at that stage uh, the Black Belt counties of Georgia uh, were in control of the state of Georgia uh, as far as uh, that proportion of what was that? Uh, 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 yes, no, uh, well, no I, was, no, I was thinking of uh, southwest Georgia, you see, and other uh, areas uh, around Albany. Uh, they were, uh, uh, yet, they, in terms of uh, uh, the Georgia Assembly, uh, they were much stronger than their. Uh, the population would warrant. But so what I was pointing out that you once you had the initiated county units. Yes, the county units, that's what I was trying to think of. The county unit system gave them much more strength than their uh, population warranted. And so that kind of information was information that young people uh, may not have had. That's number one. And number two, uh, the uh, pervasive, I mean, the persuasive argument, I think, was that once you mounted a voter registration campaign involving mass registration, you would have the resistance that you going to that you were looking for, and you could utilize, if you felt necessary, felt it necessary, the nonviolent uh, approach. 
But the most uh, uh, far-reaching concept was that too much of division uh, had taken place in struggle. And this was not necessary at this stage. And I felt that the young people were in better position to show uh, that uh, they could function uh, with and deal with these differing points of view uh, without having to split up the deal because it had been uh, one of the decisions had already been uh, reached or at least had been proposed I did propose that you have two camps and uh, I was happy to have seen the two proponents chief proponents of these two camps um, finally work out their differences Charlie, Charles Jones and Diane Nash now, I think one of the reasons why I was listened to was because I had served their interests from the beginning. At the initial, after the initial meeting in Raleigh, there were no people around who had the, let's use the vague, the broad term, know-how, to even bring together the report, or the combination of know-how and facilities, to bring together the report to uh, uh, write up certain things. And uh, they had seen me do this. Uh, they, shortly after that, you see, the, there was a delegation that had gone to uh, the Democratic and the Republican Convention. And uh, how did the material get written? Uh, the young woman, the young white woman, Jane Stembridge, who became the first executive secretary, uh, she and I spent all of the uh, 4th of July uh, she was a typist. She was a very impressive Yeah. It yeah, see. I have a copy of it. Well, you see, I had certain input that nobody else had. I had gone through the NAACP uh, period. In fact, I'd lived a long time. <laughs> see, they, and, and, and I had related here to things. And so uh, they had seen that I was not ripping them off. And up to that point, they had been able to rely on me to do what they could not do or weren't in position to do at the moment in terms of uh, the nitty-gritty work that had to be done. And so they were willing to listen. How did they actually antagonize, I'm talking about SNCC now, SCLC and the NAACP? I'm mindful of a memo that went from Roy Wilkins' office to uh, Y.T. Walker while he was executive secretary of SCLC. And he was complaining about a press release that had been issued by SNCC. And Wilkins reminded Walker uh, that SNCC, nor any other organization, could speak for the NAACP in these kinds of things, you know. And Walker sent him a letter and said he agreed with him wholeheartedly, you know. He said, you can't control these young people, boy. They're just doing things all haphazardly, like, you know. So this was one instance as to where uh, SNCC irritated uh, uh, the NAACP and SCLC. And this may have been one minute or one very small uh, factor here. So I'm asking you, can you recall any instances whereby SNCC was actually irritating or uh, uh, threatening, uh, threatening is a strong word, uh, uh, SCLC or the NAACP? I think the basic uh, 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 reasons for the reaction of let's say NAACP and SCLC to SNCC is the fact that they elected to be independent and they exercise the independence as only young people or unattached or people who are not uh, caught in a, commit in a uh, uh, framework of thought can exercise it and uh, they were open they were open to ideas that would not have been ch uh, certainly cherished or in some instances tolerated by either the NAACP or uh, SCLC. As, uh, may, as a chief example, uh, the moving into Mississippi, uh, when they decided, they called it move on Mississippi, and they called it mom. Uh, now, I think they, uh, a delegation went to talk to Thurgood Marshall, who was then the chief counsel of the NAACP, uh, regarding this, and to seek legal help. And Thurgood uh, was not responsive, in the first place because uh, they, they had 
express, the, the young people express the opinion and the determination that they were going to accept help from wherever they could get it, which meant that people like Crockett of Detroit uh, and other members of what was called, what is called the uh, uh, many white uh, lawyers, uh, the uh, National Lawyers Guild, which is uh, more leftist oriented, uh, would be objectionable to the NACP because they, they didn't want to introduce this uh, conflict of ideologies, you know, the anti of communist, communist, pro communist ideology, or leave themselves open to a charge on the part of the authorities that the communists were taking over. And so the young people had taken the position. I'm not sure of the sequence of whether the, uh, this memo, I don't know when this memo, it, it had to be, though, know, after why it came in. Uh, the young people had taken the position that uh, they accepted help wherever they could get it. And one aspect of the help, for instance, that was uh, being sought in Mississippi was the uh, uh, utilization of, uh, let's call it, untried or unpopular methods of dealing legally uh, with the questions that arose out of the conflict, out of the struggle in Mississippi. And uh, persons like uh, the, uh, those who were uh, not within the old framework, the old lawyer framework, were much more open to trying these new things. And uh, by the weeks, uh, we can later deal with some of the specifics. I mean, I can refresh myself sometime or somewhere and find some documentation for you. Uh, but this, I think, was the basis. And now, uh, but behind that, I think, uh, to be very honest, was the uh, feeling that here was this group of upstarts that nobody could control and that they ought to be part of either my organization or your organization. I think we have dealt somewhat in our conversation, I believe, uh, with the uh, fact that at the initial meeting uh, there was this effort, uh, very strong effort, on the part of representations from at least a couple of organizations uh, to have the young people as part of them. And of course, there uh, was a, almost a foregone conclusion on the part of SCLC that uh, because the meeting had been uh, called by, called you. by you were delivered. Uh, yes, well, I guess they had. I had thought of it that way, but there was a <laughs> foregone conclusion that the essence of SCLC, quote, end quote, sponsored the meeting, that it was uh, they would uh, be a part. Uh, that's, I remember in, the, in, the, in the Raleigh at the time, Wyatt expressed the opinion he was particularly interested in it because he was coming in, you see, as executive director, and he wanted a strong arm. Uh, the unfortunate part was that there was an assumption on the part of the ministers, uh, part of the SCLC personnel who was there, that they could literally dictate, I use the term advisedly, uh, dictate to representatives from uh, their area and control their voting. Uh, and uh, it was at that point I walked out of the meeting. Uh, there was this uh, quote unquote uh, meeting of the chief executives. These were adults and not a young person present. Uh, and at which they were revoicing such opinions as I can speak to so and so and I can talk to. Uh, uh, Thornton from Virginia, and I can control, uh, uh, say, uh, yeah. one from Ben Montgomery, uh, Bernard Lee. Yeah, we are uh, talking about how to use these. Yes, yeah. uh, and you see, this was a, a completely uh, uh, intolerable to me. But uh, they eventually experienced a rude awakening in trying to deal with these young people. Uh, the young people just weren't listening to them. Well, you see, that was their first experience uh, of recognizing that the, the young people were going to make their own decisions. Uh, I, they, because at that time, they found that they weren't able to control the voting. There was, uh, at this meeting in Raleigh, uh, Dr. King and Reverend Lawson, I think, were the two people that uh, gave keynote addresses. You know, they both were really outstanding. Uh, but from reading about accounts of that meeting, uh, one uh, gets the impression that the students were much more impressed with the speech by Reverend Lawson than they were with the speech by Dr. King. They had to be. 
was Lawson uh, that more uh, uh, knowledgeable and, and, and persuasive in his presentations than uh, Dr. King? How do you account for this, uh, the fact that he made a much more profound impression on the youth than uh, Dr. King? Well, I think Dr. King, uh, in this measure, um, even from there and in some other instances in my way of thinking, was the victim of his own background, namely that of being uh, uh, a preacher and who had relied to a large extent on the impact of eloquence. And uh, so, and uh, but uh, Lawson, uh, had not only com uh, the eloquence enough to be heard, but he had the persuasiveness of argument. And uh, this, and he also had the credentials, as far as the young were concerned, of having been a part of uh, that student effort in uh, Nashville. And uh, see, the Nashville group at that initial meeting in Raleigh was regarded as the group because they came with a great deal of indoctrination. They had indoctrination, but they also had provided action and they had suffered. And so uh, they were, they had their credentials there and these credentials were recognized by the young. And as far as Dr. King was concerned, uh, he, he had not, his, his speech, I don't remember his speech, but his speech could not possibly have had the same relevance because uh, even if he, uh, because, uh, that Lawson did, because he had not been engaged in uh, the uh, what the students had been doing with the same degree of membership, let's call it. He was still outside. All right, this is a little derivative, but it's not too far the line of what we're talking about. And, and this brings to mind a man by the name of Vincent Harding. Yes, oh, I love Vincent. Now, the reason I'm raising this now, bringing up his name right now is that uh, I've been informed somewhere in my interviewing that Dr. King somewhat feared or uh, was a little bit reluctant to deal with in a very open and, 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 and comprehensive way. Uh, personalities such as Vincent Harding and Reverend Jane Lawson. Uh, did you get an impression like that? Did you ever get the impression that King regarded these men as somewhat of a threat to his position with their knowledge and power of persuasive? I could say I got the impression that, uh, uh, specifically, uh, that he was loath to do this. Uh, but I think I think I can make a generalization that I, uh, Martin suffered from uh, self-protectiveness that frequently goes with one who has been accorded high uh, place in public image, and uh, he was not uh, sufficiently secure. I think to feel that uh, he could exist and they could exist without being, uh, without feeling that they were competitive or threats. I don't think he even maybe, he may not have been conscious of that. I don't know. I won't say. Yeah. But uh, this is not uncommon, you see, especially is it not uncommon out of the background which he comes. You have to continue to emphasize that. He had not had the kind of organizational discipline that either Mar uh, that Lawson had had, or Vincent, because I think Vincent was part of uh, friends. Uh, friends. Yes, and he had. You see, that was, that's dialogue. That's where people talk things out a lot, where they have been had a long series of discussions. On. See, Martin had not had these things. And his uh, PhD in ethics and philosophy. Was, uh, couldn't possibly prepare him for this kind of... No, because you needed to have some... Uh, you need. I don't care how much uh, reading you do. If you haven't had uh, the interchange of uh, dialogue and confrontation with others, uh, you can be frightened uh, by uh, a, someone who comes and, pers uh, and, in, and is in position to confront you. Right. With especially, especially if they confront you uh, with an air of security and independence. Yes, and they, and they come with their own credentials, yeah. you see. And uh, there was an insecurity, I think. I don't know whether he was ever aware of it, but uh, and it's a natural insecurity coming out of that Baptist tradition. Because, you see, the Baptist ministers have never uh, had, had been strong on uh, dialogue. It's a victim. 
now we're coming back again to SCLC. Can you recall any ministers in that organization uh, that impressed you as being individuals who, who sought uh, uh, practical ways of dealing with problems and the institutionalization of a policy-making kind of apparatus in SCLC? Was anybody who was put pressure? We mentioned Shirtlesworth and people like uh, Jamison out of uh, Louisiana, you know. But can you think of any other people who was trying to apply constant pressure to the creation of, of, of a kind of a structure which would allow for the dealing and a tactical and flexible situation for dealing with practical problems and the institutionalization of a, a uh, decision-making apparatus? Well, uh, I would think Keller Miller Smith certainly would be a person within that context, you see, within the natural situation, too. But uh, I think he was not too happy, uh, you know, with the lack of that uh, developing... Uh, he was too happy with the, maybe the manner in which the structure was being developed or, or the mechanism for decision-making uh, was uh, being developed. Um, uh, but you mentioned Sh the Shuttlesworth. I think they questioned inside, but you see, there's also this business of closing ranks after the question. Explain that for me. That means uh, we're on the same board. And uh, if we are inside, behind closed doors, we can differ. Uh, but when you have, quote, end quote, the great leader, you close ranks right. in public. Yes, and that in itself sometimes decimates the effectiveness of the uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. Especially when the leader is open to advice and uh, receptive to advice and uh, from others who weren't even at the meeting. Okay. That's very good. That's very informative and enlightening there because you had explained earlier this closing rank kind of yeah. thing. And uh, in, in addition to decimating, uh, it, it has an almost an escalate kind of an effect, especially on a strong personality when behind closed doors you can pour it all out. But you never can enjoy the whole forum for trying to influence people to your way of thinking, you know, and uh, this is something I'm going to have to examine and try to see just how strong we are people dealt with this kind of a situation. I think a man like Kelly Miller Smith of Nashville, a person like Fred Shows, where they had to be uncomfortable and frustrated a lot of times because these were people who wanted to express their own ideas and ways of doing things, I think. Well, in all probability, but I think Kelly was uh, perhaps feeling more secure at being in Nashville and having played a role there. And I, he may have even reached a point of wanting to retire from a certain kind of role. I don't know. See, um, what am I predicating that upon? The fact that I don't think he had, uh, since the uh, students of Nashville were in the uh, confrontation uh, issue, at the, in the stage of confrontation, I don't think he has been instrumental in developing any program that precipitated confrontation. So that's number one. And a person like Fred, he had his own uh, uh, machinery that was continuing uh, in Birmingham up until the time of the Birmingham quote-unquote movement that uh, Martin identified with. Uh, I mean, he knew he was able to keep going. See? So I think this is part of it. All right. So, well, let me ask you again about this, this man, Reverend Y.T. Walker. Uh, he uh, assumed the executive directorship uh, right after you after your acting directorship. Whatever uh, you call term, it. Or whatever, right? <laughs> don't feel, I'm trying to give a name. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, but do you, can you enlighten me on the process involved in, in selecting YT Walker, number one, who recommended him, you know? And uh, after his recommendation, uh, who interviewed him? And like, I know you and Mr. Levinson talked to Reverend Tilly and subsequently recommended him, and he was eventually hired. Can you explain the process of selecting Wyatt T. Walker? Well, Wyatt had uh, a movement uh, in, uh, or had involved in movement in Petersburg. Uh, I think at the stage that he came into contact with uh, Martin, uh, he came as president of uh, Petersburg, whatever it was. He had also been identified with CORE in Virginia, and had worked uh, with NAACP in Virginia. His uh, child, I think, his daughter, I believe it's his daughter, uh, was the guinea pig 
in the school situation in, Fitt in Petersburg, you know, after the 54 decision. That's what happened to my son in Thompson, George. Is that so? Yeah, he used them as a guinea pig. I never do that again. I yeah. never advised him about sending that kid to run them all white school. Yeah. I couldn't do that in good conscience. No, anymore. Never. Yeah, yeah. Never but, be a pioneer again. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, Wyatt uh, had had that experience, plus uh, he had been to uh, uh, several of the meetings. I, he was not at the, I don't think he was at the organizing meeting, I'm not sure. But he was at the uh, conference, the first of the so-called nonviolent conferences that was held at the uh, and uh, at uh, Spelman. Forgot about those. Oh, yeah. We have more. I have missed it. <laughs> yeah, I did that one, too. <laughs> so, um, and uh, that's where I met him. I didn't know him. I knew of him. And I think he'd been coming to meetings. Now, who first spoke to him about being executive? I am not sure whether I'm the one, but I think I am. I had, uh, he and his wife were visiting New York. And a good friend, a uh, mutual good friend, George Lawrence, the Reverend George Lawrence. Uh, I had known George in his escalation up the ladder. And uh, I invited them to come to the house. I even cooked the lamb. <laughs> and uh, we had dinner, and I raised the question of why, with why, of being the executive director. Now, he may have had uh, inclinations and aspirations for it before. And he may have been approached by somebody, I don't know. But I do know that. And uh, I am uh, not too sure whether I uh, I probably may have spoken to or uh, voiced this around uh, in the circle of Martin a lot. I don't know because I hadn't left completely then, I don't think. And so uh, uh, that was uh, a first step uh, that I know of. And uh, so. Of course, why, uh, why being the personal individual he is, and a contemporary, age-wise and uh, style-wise, let's call it, uh, of Martin, uh, that was not too difficult a bridge to cross, and they had had very little or no success in finding a minister uh, to be the executive director. They were still a minister. Yes, it had to be a minister. Certainly, it had to be a male. It had to be a minister still. I told you about those uh, criteria for selection. Yes. When I bought it. You that down. It's yeah. in his papers. Yeah. Now, it was a point that he was trying to make. It's another thing I don't know. But he certainly suggested that we ought to consider a person who may not necessarily be a minister. And the implication being that uh, executive skills should take priority over his religious uh, affiliation, you know, or his religious, religious needs. And, uh, Reddick and all these other people made similar kinds of suggestions. But it's no one stipulated that, that he has, yeah, one man, uh, Reverend Lowry, suggested that it should be a minister. Now maybe his suggestion took precedence over everybody's else. Well, in terms of documentation. You, you know, uh, I'd, I'd be interested in the date for that. Well, it was before the selection of Reverend Tilly. Uh -huh. It was uh, a criteria suggested uh, for them to consider in trying to uh, get a person like Reverend Tilly. Well, I think maybe uh, Martin's uh, verbalizations regarding it did not necessarily have to be a minister uh, could have come as a result of uh, uh, his con consultation with uh, persons like uh, uh, Stanley and uh, Bud Byard, and then even maybe the, my own presence there at the time, you see, and the fact that they had made approaches to other ministers and had not... Uh, a minister of a certain standing, like uh, uh, my Pitts, you see, and had not uh, gotten a favorable response, you see. So it was and it may have been uh, more political than uh, uh, to have made that kind of statement. Right, and we're not going to mention it, you know, it's yeah. about yeah. 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 the fact of the matter is they did select the minister. Yes. Uh, and they only have had some minister, <laughs> even Andy Young. Can you think of any layman that uh, played permanent roles or were elected to any official uh, position? That, well, I don't have any record of it. Maybe you can recall something that hasn't been written down. Can you think of any uh, layman that was elected to a position other than a lawyer? Yeah, I have Augustine. I feel, uh, yeah, Augustine, yeah. Augustine, Augustine yeah. and uh, he's the only one that I've seen who's not a minister listed uh, in some permanent position. Yeah, 
Well, no, the only non-minister who is, uh, uh, as I recall, with the executive board was uh, Dr. Simpkin. Uh, yeah, that's right. He's yeah. MD, not a... Yes. No, no he's a dentist, DDS. Right. Yeah, he's a DDS. And uh, oh, I think, but you see, he had a good movement. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. They could be. Yeah. Right. There you are. This uh, brings me to questions about uh, other people whose name I've seen frequently in the earlier stages of SCLC. For example, uh, Dr. Reddick, who was formerly at uh, Alabama yes. State and was a designated official historian of the organization. Uh, he figured prominently in a number of executive uh, committee meetings. Uh, his name. Uh, yes. You never see what they said because I don't have records of the minutes and I haven't been able to find them. Uh, but uh, can you recall uh, what you perceive his role to be in the organization, Dr. Lawrence Reddick? Well, uh, Reddick was in Montgomery at the time of the, uh, I believe, at the time of the boycott. He was teaching there. Certainly he was there uh, at the time of the strive to its freedom, and I think to a large extent uh, may have. Uh, been the actual uh, uh, writer, if, if not the actual writer, certainly the guy he had in the development of that well, book. Of yes. So um, uh, there was a certain amount of rapport, let's call it, that had already been established and, uh, between him and Martin, and then Martin, of course, being male uh, and a PhD, he would have some respect for one who was also who had these credentials. Uh, and uh, so he was part of uh, the executive committee, but I'm not sure that he had any overriding influence uh, at all. But uh, uh, and then he left Montgomery. Yes, and went to uh, uh, Coffin State. In yes, Baltimore Coffin State, Maryland. and then from there to Philadelphia. Yes, that's where he's present. Yes, I was in touch with him while he was I see. Uh, well. Uh, I don't know, uh, you haven't had a chance to... No, he to told me that uh, he would talk with me mm -hmm. and uh, he would try and see what he could contribute to my study, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, he was the official and still is, yeah, the historian, you know, and the historian to me is the person well, they, supposed to have all... Uh, you haven't had a chance to... No, he to told me that... Uh, he would talk with me, and uh, he would try and see what he could contribute to my study, you know, but uh, he was the official, and still is, yeah, his the historian, you know, and the historian to me is the person well, they, who's supposed to have all the records and things. He has the... Uh, <laughs> well, that was the person I got from talking to, yeah. you know, what can I can? Let's see, Dr. King. He hasn't written any history. Not, yeah, not, not uh, sizable. No, he's written yeah. this uh, thing about the friendly warrior, yeah. whatever it was, uh, that, on uh, that biography of Dr. King, yeah. the uh, Montgomery book. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, he hasn't turned out too much about NCLC. No. And I'm, you know, checking on his territory. Now, you see, he had input. He had, he had capacity for input in the area you first mentioned regarding uh, when you raised the question of Bolshevik revolution. Yeah. He had the knowledge about these things. He had also uh, some association with the uh, He should have taken prominently in the development of an ideology if he was known in history as a president, you know, yeah. and, and their deliberations. And, uh, well, so perhaps he could not figure, uh, because uh, first place, uh, when you have an end, you're faced with a a complete embankment of ministers who feel that uh, having been called by God, uh, as they claim, uh, for leadership, why, that's enough. And who had not had the disciplines of thinking and, and, and the real dialogue, especially dialogue that differed with the Yeah. Well, let me go to this here. This is, but you had one assignment that I think uh, kept you frustrated a great deal. This is the person I get from looking at the documents and your reports on them. You were in charge of a uh, book, Strive to a Freedom, and the assignment I'm searching for numbers of books to different people throughout the country. Uh, was that as a fr uh, as frustrating experience as I uh, perceived in looking at your responses and your tallies of 
the number of books she'd given to various ministers, and the amount of money that they had turned in, and some of them trying to make the case that they didn't get X number of books and things of that sort. Was this a really frustrating experience, or did you take it in stride? I hope that uh, yeah, I took it in stride, more or less, but it wasn't part of what I had uh, conceived of as uh, my role. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I mean, after all, you see, I was just uh, there to do what, quote, end quote, had to be done. <laughs> I mean, this is the concept, you know, this would be the first thing that would come up, you see. Um, so I even, I think, uh, uh, they, when the book came out, Chile went to the National Baptist Convention. And I went to Detroit to that uh, other Baptist convention. And um, so that, uh, and from then on, and especially I think Tilly was gone and I would have to put, take these, get these books shipped out and all that kind of stuff. No, and of course I had to buy my own scheme without any time maybe to deal with it. Right, you had to hire somebody in Detroit to help you yes, with the books. Yes. Because no pre preparation had been said, no preparation had been made, you see. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I have it. All of yeah. the books, the amount of money you collected. Yeah. You got rid of all of them in Detroit except three books. All yeah. the books were kind of for except three. Except three, yeah. Uh, I, yes, I had to, I remember doing that. Yes, that's right. All of that is there. Yeah. But uh, this was a, supposed to be a source of revenue for SCLC. Did it really bring in... I don't think it has ever been a highly... Um, uh, uh, goods a big source of that. I don't think the amount of money that certainly that part that came in while I was there could not be considered, in my opinion, as a big source. Right, a lot of time and energy and personnel was invested in bringing this thing off. You know, yeah. part of Dr. King and the organization itself. And I don't know if it balances out in terms of gain received with the amount invested in it or not. And I was curious to answer that. Well, I wouldn't uh, certainly. It's Directly, it did not, as far as I could conceive of it. And uh, but uh, especially going to these conventions, you see, uh, I, I didn't think of it as such. I don't recall the, what the total came to be. Yeah, well, it's listed there. Yeah. You have it down there. So. But the, another conceptual kind of a question: Did they ever attempt to define in any specific way the role of the executive director, and associate director? Yes. Well, when you say specific, you... Uh, you know, just uh, give you uh, a job description, you know, like you attempted to do. And it didn't, and it didn't, you, didn't, you didn't get it beforehand, and uh, uh, I think uh, after we had been pushing for certain things, and I said, because uh, I remember in my last days, I was pushing for not only job descriptions, but certainly uh, certain other uh, bases of consideration. Sort of like coffee break. Yes. You know, I, uh, yeah. your whole memo to him about this. Yes. This, this and uh, this was predicated upon the fact that there were people, uh, people came without the same kind of experience and training uh, than as the, uh, that the person, let's say, who was there with me and was getting more. And, uh, oh yes. Uh, but this is personal. Uh, and uh, this I, of course, objected to. And uh, uh, thank goodness the child group, the young lady who came, uh, I think I told you she came from that part of Georgia. South of Maine. Yeah. And she was one, one of Y.T. White, White, White Walker's secretaries. No, uh, but she may have stayed there a while, a while after he came. But, she did. And uh, yeah, she Mrs. resigned to go to Lockheed. Lockheed, yeah. She wrote him a letter of yes. presentation. Yeah, because you see, uh, there was nobody else there. And they, uh, I think the Reverend King brought in uh, his former, one of his former church secretaries as uh, a bookkeeper, I believe. But, uh, and then there was this great division of capacity, of, you know, responsibility. Uh, and uh, there was not the necessary rapport that could, should have existed. You see, I'm sure uh, Mrs. Mrs. Brown, I believe. Was that right. was the name, yes. Mrs. Brown. Uh, oh, wow. yes. Beautiful. Dog lady. Yeah, yes, nice. She had so much capacity, and thank goodness we were help, very helpful in getting her to release herself from the uh, syndrome. Well, of well she did. I, oh, yeah. I have to let her when she resigned. Yeah. Now, we, we, we've been talking on the periphery. I'm going to ask you directly now, and treat it in the way you see fit. Uh, I'm 
Can you describe your relationship with Dr. King for me? What kind of a relationship did you have while you were working as a person in charge of the uh, citizenship project, as one who served as associate director, and as one who served as acting director? <laughs> well, in the initial stages, I practically no no relationship. He was not relating to the uh, situation too well, let's put it that way. Uh, he would, they were living in, still in Montgomery, and he would come to Atlanta, and I'd never see him. Uh, well, who was your, he was the president of the organization? Yes, he was. Well, uh, who did you relate to in terms of trying to, who, 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 who was helpful? Right, and, and who suggested to you uh, what your role should be in the organization? No one. There was no, I mean, after all. Who could tell you? Okay, okay. <laughs> no, no, no one had suggested to me because first place, they, uh, they, they could, uh, the background for conceptualizing it was not there in terms of uh, uh, the leadership, the top leadership. Uh, but uh, uh, they had this idea of having these meetings. See, that's where it stopped. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then what does it take to get those meetings? I think they, to a large extent, Martin was depending on fire, you see. Uh, and the, uh, of course, at the last stages, I think for the last couple of days before the meetings took place, fire came down. But you see, he didn't need to come down then. But uh, of course, that could yeah, also that, be yeah. taken as uh, proof of his, uh, I mean, after all, if you were supposed to be the top as a of fact, strategist. Uh, you and Bayer uh, designated as co-directors of the citizenship. Yeah. On the letterhead of all Yes, you see. So, uh, well, that's that's the way it goes. Uh, so, uh, uh, from the standpoint of um, my relationship with Mark, I think my, it was mutual, uh, almost mutual uh, tolerance in a sense, certain sense. I understood from the beginning that I was not going, I didn't go there with any hope or any expectation of being uh, a key figure, recognized as such. Uh, but this is another one of those efforts that I felt that, all right, things had to be done. I was in position to do them, and uh, hopefully it would be part and parcel of a contribution to moving things ahead. I think that maybe from Martin's standpoint, uh, well, you have to tolerate what you have to tolerate. I don't know. Uh, I had heard in later years that he um, said or felt that, uh, I don't know whether he said it or someone else, but uh, I, I don't want to say I hated him or disliked him or something like that. But you see, Martin wasn't good at receiving uh, questioning, uh, critical questioning. And he said this kind, this is not only, he was not alone because this is, a, this is a pattern with ministers. And to come, see, after all, who was I? I was female, I was old, I uh, <laughs> didn't have any PhDs, and uh, for some of the, some, an interesting uh, angle, um, there was a, con a uh, news conference had, there was a little gathering between NAACP officials and uh, CLC officials in connection with some voter uh, registration program. Uh, uh, Roy, Roy Wilkins and I think Bob Carter came down and then of course there was Martin and Ralph and others and, uh, and then of course there was the uh, news conference and uh, uh, I remember I believe it was Ralph who said to me he wouldn't have let himself be ignore it in the situation, you see, a role in it, because I, he knew I knew more about the history of uh, voter registration and what had taken place in the struggle uh, than, uh, than the well, uh, not uh, all of the people that, out there well, out the field. Well, equally as my, I at least was familiar with all the things that the NACP had done, you see, historically, and uh, I, uh, Martin didn't have that historical information, tip finger. And uh, uh, he had not been active in uh, getting around in the in that current period. So, but it didn't sir. It didn't bother me. Maybe it should have. I don't know. Well, here's the thing that kind of bothered me, and I was at a loss to understand. 
there was a question about press releases. Anyway, uh, Mark and Bear, I guess they suggested to each other that no press releases would go out of the office unless they first read and approved it, you know. And you, they must have told you that or something like that, because I got the impression that a memo or something you sent back to Martin that the next press release, you would let him read it before it would be released. Did you ever have any difficulty at all with them on press releases? No, I don't recall too much of a difficulty because maybe I didn't recognize it. Well, this was a little, it was a little nuanced kind of thing. Well, you know you don't know which, you, when, you know, that was that, no, that was, was, uh, it was that, that was late. 59, late 59. Yeah, when I, when it, when it first. That's uh, right, I, just about uh, going into the 60s. I yeah. might have been early 60s before. Well, you see, I was on my way out of there. Oh, and you were informing him that... I had indicated, I had indicated that, uh, uh, see, it, I think it was in December of 59, that I would, uh, uh, see, after, well, December or maybe early 60, uh, that I would be leaving, and, uh, see, I think I left in August of 60. I stayed there till the Wyatt was chosen. Well, I was trying to detect from, from that uh, little memo to whether or not they were trying to put a stranglehold. Well, on I'm you. sure, you see, they uh, were, were, I don't know what, I don't remember any press release that they uh, uh, had any basis for objecting to. But, see, I had to write letters and sign Martin's name to them. And a couple of occasions, for instance, a uh, situation in, uh, I think, the mayor of Birmingham or something there, and I, you, you brought the issue up to him, you sent him information, and nothing came, so you eventually did it. Uh, sent a letter out, or certainly now when the meeting was held in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, uh, uh, the letters uh, that are signed nominally by him, uh, who wrote them? Yeah. Uh, see. And uh, you, you had to get them out. So I don't recall that, I don't think probably was a growing feeling, you see, that... Uh, yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that. I can't recall this exact if you have to, If you happen to dig up that memo, I'd be... Uh, I'll send you a copy. Yes, I'd be glad. I'd be glad. And well, I'll well, clarify as best I can. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a uh, 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 situation involving the... the uh, uh, when did you let them know that would be back. Did they give you any kid any indication that they would be happy for you to leave or they didn't want you to stay around and you just decided that it was best for you to just get on out of the thing? I well, mean, there was every indication, you see, from the beginning that uh, my presence there was not one uh, that could be a very tolerable uh, situation for, for, for me uh, in the sense of what role can you play effectively? Uh, you feel the breach of having nobody to, to instigate or to conduct the, in, uh, I mean, to draft uh, or, or get together that initial meeting. Yeah. I didn't, I went to stay six weeks. That's all I had planned. And then after that, they were still without anybody. So I stayed on. And then uh, uh, when the sit-ins broke, uh, I suggested, of course, that there need to be some, at least, a meeting of sit-in leaders uh, for the purpose of uh, communication, if not coordination. And that's how I we had the uh, April 1960 meeting in Shaw, out of which SNCC, as a uh, viable uh, uh, organization, uh, got its roots. Well, I don't know. I was, I was curious to ask you about that because it kind of disturbed me to see that kind of demo. Well, in all probability, there were lots, lots of uh, consultations and uh, uh, discussions uh, uh, around my role and around me that did not uh, come to my life. I'm confident. Did you and Martin, did you recall any confrontation that the two of you had that uh, was a little volatile? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, that. Uh, you had an argument of anything of that sort? Or you were just, uh, as you suggested well, earlier, tolerating each other? Well, no, uh, see, uh, I would raise questions about things that were un intolerable, not towards me as such, but policy-wise. 
I liked the question of the differential in salary for a young person who, had, who was capable and had come under difficult circumstances and worked effectively, uh, getting less than someone who was brought in uh, and did not, uh, and wasn't doing too much, you see, that's number one. The differential there. I was, uh, I would confront on the basis of uh, uh, regulations uh, regarding how you hire people and how, what kind of rights they had and so sort of things like that. And uh, um, I would also uh, raise questions about uh, issue, any issue that came up that I did because I would voice my opinion on it. So I think the situation was a mutually tolerable situation. Uh, now I recall the, um, this just comes to mind, the newsletter uh, Jane Stembridge and I started it. Beautiful, you know, having the copies of that. Now. I have one copy of the newsletter. Yeah. One copy. Before you, you indicated all the meetings. That's the only thing that all of the meetings that they had had. Uh, uh -huh. but there was no content about what transpired at these meetings, but I do have a date, and I can go back and try to get newspaper accounts of things in these cities. Just to see. Did they ever report on these meetings that, uh, that yeah. took place? Like you had a non-violence conference in Durham, you had one in Streetport, you had one in Montgomery. At the same time during the years of 57 and 58, there were about six meetings. The large and mass meetings. A mass meeting. Yeah. These were large mass meetings. Yeah. Did they ever report on these meetings in the newspapers? Well, they would uh, hope to have the press there. See, this was part of the format. Big meeting. Uh, would the local press. newspapers report on Well, uh, I, I don't know. You never did check into these no, news accounts, huh? They, they probably had uh, some, see, uh, some reports. I didn't, uh, we had no record. I didn't keep any record of okay, so that's way I'm going to try to get at that. Yeah. I'm going to first get the local newspapers That's of right, these yes. cities that you met in. I have yeah. all of them listed here. Yeah, you, and, uh, you see, wherever Martin went at that time, at least some news uh, coverage took place. Yeah. Well, I have all the meetings listed, the date of the place yeah. that they took place, and I'm going to try to get these uh, newspapers to give uh, some reading of, yeah. of, of the temple. Uh, now, you see, for instance, uh, the initial meeting, uh, that was held in Montgomery, at which the name of SCLC was determined. Uh, I was there. Well, I thought that meeting uh, took place in New York. That was the second meeting in February of uh, 67. 57. 57. Yeah. Well, uh, what do you have there for a meeting in Montgomery? Well, I mean, so fighting. Because he had respect for me, and he had respect to take going way back. Right. Even as a student, I was in position to uh, sort of elicit respect. Mm -hmm. I and uh, I had respect for him. Uh, I don't recall our having too many actual conferences about what was because, see, this was coming from, he had a great deal of uh, uh, sensitivity to carrying out uh, the, uh, let's call it, the wishes of the president, let's put it that way. Okay. Right. Yeah. Burger. Yeah. And therefore, um, it, his initiating may, that may have been a frustration even for him, see, although he was not a very aggressive person in the sense of, uh, uh, want to dominate the scene, or at least showing the desire to dominate the scene. But it, could, it had to have some degree of uh, frustration. Because the president so often you couldn't find him. Yeah. Uh, this is what's a, a, a thing that you give the impression of. I gave the impression that he was the most businessman in the country. <laughs> uh, in order to get Dr. King to speak at a particular place, you yeah. have to contact him about a year and a half in advance. Yeah. You know, and uh, unless uh, it involved the person that <laughs> potentially, you know, had potentials for giving money, 
uh, one of his favorite friends, you know, one of his favorite white institutions. Yeah. He, he Which, could always find time to go to Hollywood. Yeah, I see his schedule. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, well, at least that makes a difference. It makes a difference. They had a schedule, and uh, a person who wanted him to speak at Harvard or Yale yeah, or uh, one of these yeah, big yeah. schools could, uh, could get through. contact them about a month and a half before time. Yeah. But a lady like Miss Hughes, who was giving him all that money out in Houston, Texas. Yeah, I remember her. Uh, she used to work she for about two years. years. Uh, yeah. How much money did she finally give? Oh, she gave him one time better than a thousand dollars to come out and speak uh, to her graduating class. I see. At that business school. Yeah. This lady is a fantastic lady to me in her letters. Yeah. Uh, she would write him all the time. And when Reverend Jackson attacked her, Oh yeah, Jack, Jack, Jack uh, Baptist. Uh, Jack Baptist. Oh, she really man blasted. So it's a lot of. Uh, I'd like to share that. Thank you. Uh, at the July the 22nd through 24th, uh, 1959 Institute on Nonviolent Resistance to Segregation meeting, uh, which represented, according to uh, the memo, the first South-wide effort to evaluate nonviolent resistance instrument for social change. Uh, uh, you suggested in your memo that Reverend Wyatt T. Walker was preparing the recommendations and findings of that meeting. Did he ever submit this to anybody? Not to me. We, we were talking about the question of Harry Belafonte's involvement in the movement. And you indicated to me that he had come out of a tradition of movement somewhat to the left, too. Could you recall that for me, please, where I can try to get that done? Well, frankly, I am not uh, true, uh, truly aware of the specifics, but you see, he came out as a young man uh, struggling in the, the uh, area of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time when in the New York area, you had a uh, uh, atmosphere in which uh, the so-called ultra-left, such liberals as Mrs. Uh, Roosevelt mm -hmm. and others were speaking on the same platform. So he was not unaware of the leftist movement, and I don't know personally of his you know, involvement. But I do know at the time of the 1957 prayer of pilgrimage, uh, he was uh, uh, N -S -C -N NAACP, of course, had gotten him involved with the prayer of pilgrimage. And uh, they had a press conference uh, down at uh, the, uh, uh, where uh, the NAACP headquarters, and I was told that they, uh, he was there and they, uh, banned him, I was told. Now, I wasn't there, and, uh, see, but uh, I wouldn't have doubted Do you think he might have been classified as one of those young Turks in the NAACP? No, I don't, he wasn't in the, I think, no, I, if anything, they must have banned him because of his prior affiliations. They may have thought of him as, quote, end quote, red. Oh, see, yeah. I think this was the anti-communist uh, reaction on the part of NAACP. Now, whether he was ever one or was, I don't know, and uh, it doesn't matter. But well, that's very good. He in the liberal tradition in his philosophical thinking, I would think. Okay. And uh, uh, since then, he has uh, uh, been associated uh, with uh, uh, the liberal movements in the entertainment world, you know. So, so that's what yeah. I want. I want to get a basis uh, for consideration and something I 